So in the past few years, I've been getting really into anime films. You know, stuff like Your Name, Akira, that other one that I don't ever talk about. But a lot more recently, I started watching films made by a specific director and studio that isn't Studio Ghibli. Studio Chizu is a relatively new animation studio since it was only founded in 2011, but by that time, Amuro Hosoda, the director for all the studio's projects, had already made three feature films. The lineup of films under the studio consists of The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, Summer Wars, Wolf Children, The Boy and the Beast, Mirai, and Belle. Which, fun fact, he's been releasing these films every three years consistently since 2006, which is honestly kind of impressive. These films, despite being animated, still has that sense of realistic, slice of life kind of vibe, but also at the same time has that wonderful and magical feel that you can only really compare to one other studio which is due to the fact that they all focus on the theme of recontextualizing a seemingly normal part of life into a fantastical setting. Stories of family, empathy, and bonding are all told through worlds where there's time travel, werewolves, two different metaverses, and a secret society of animal people. Like I said, movies around typical real-life scenarios in a fantastical setting, which if you said that to someone and asked to guess what movies you were talking about, they'd probably name Ghibli. But there are so many things with Hosoda's style that differentiate him from someone like Hayao Miyazaki. Obviously his visual style is very different, but his intense focus on characters and just the overall tone of his films is just so unique compared to stories from Ghibli. A lot of people have labeled Hosoda as the next Miyazaki, but honestly, I don't even think that's possible to replicate that kind of filmmaking. Hell, people don't even consider his own son to be the next Miyazaki. My point is, Hosoda doesn't have any names or titles to live up to, he's already made a big enough name for himself to where he doesn't need to become Miyazaki's successor. And fun fact, he was originally supposed to direct Howl's Moving Castle, but he got fired, and eventually went on to make our first film on our list. The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, even back in 2006, was a sleeper hit. A lot of people like to praise Hosoda's later works, and rightfully so, but I think this film was a really strong starting point for Hosoda and the studio. The story is about Makoto, who is, as the title suggests, a girl who gains the ability to leap through time with a walnut. Initially, she uses it to deal with a lot of minor issues in her life, like getting to school on time, getting better grades, avoiding embarrassing situations and questions, the average things that a teenager would do if they gained the ability to time travel. But in doing so, Makoto learns that even minor changes in a situation lead to a drastically different result. And in short, Makoto, who's never really taken her future seriously, realizes that always thinking about the past is stunting her growth, and by the end, she finally finds what she wants to pursue, which is... I don't know, they never say. I think this movie is really good. Thematically speaking, the movie is very effective in conveying the right emotions in certain scenes. For example, Makoto's first use of time leaping is when she's about to get hit by a train after her bike breaks. I like trains. <laughs> For the most part, everything after that is pretty calm. Like I said before, Makoto only uses her powers for really trivial things. There aren't any huge stakes in the plot until the next train scene. We follow Makoto running around looking for Kosuke before he goes down the same hill on the same broken bike. She doesn't feel the need to time skip because technically nothing's happened yet. And when she gets to the hill, everything seems fine. No accidents have happened, Kosuke is nowhere to be found. Then Makoto gets a call from Chiaki asking if she's been time leaping and she uses her last available time leap to avoid the question. So she used her last charge on something really trivial again. But, you know, it's fine, because no one got hurt, right? That is until Kosuke just comes barreling down the hill in like an instant. And honest to God, my mouth was gaping open during this whole scene. I was terrified. The lighthearted, carefree tone of the film so far is heavily contrasted by this anxiety-filled sequence, and I honestly thought they were going to legit unceremoniously kill someone here. But I forgot, I'm watching an anime film. Obviously, Chiaki turns out to be from the future, saves Tosuke at the last minute, explains the time travel process, and disappears for seemingly no reason. 
obviously. Yeah, the third act of the film is really contrived and confusing. This film, along with most of Asoda's other works, are best when they're simple, and having this exposition scene at the climax of the film feels a little forced. But like I said before, this film is still really solid thematically speaking. As unconvincing as it is, the fact that Makoto couldn't tell Chiaki her feelings before he disappears is still pretty emotional. Even when she gets the opportunity to go back, it's not a guarantee that she'll even be with Chiaki and she has to live with that choice. She has to stop worrying about mistakes she's made in the past and live in the present. And honestly, that's a good enough message for me to forgive a few logical missteps. And stepping away from the story, the art styles are pretty good. The animation is kind of sloppy sometimes, but the character designs are still well drawn and the cinematography and still images are amazing. And some of the gags are pretty fun too, but specifically, I really like Makoto's personality. She's just so goofy all the time. She's just rolling into walls and cackling all the time. It, it fits really well with her carefree attitude. Overall, the girl who led through time is is pretty good. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense plot-wise, and the animation gets a little rusty at times, but it's emotionally rich and has a really good message. So, there's actually a really fun thing that Hosoda does, where he takes an element of one of his older films and expands upon it in his next one. As you can see here, Makoto is traveling through time and flies past some kind of war, and earlier Kosuke mentions they're looking forward to Summer Wars takes place in the world of Oz, an online platform where a majority of the real world systems are connected in one central hub. One of the Discord moderators for the platform, Kenji, is hired by Natsuki to come with her to the family estate and is basically forced to pretend to be her fiance in front of Natsuki's grandmother on her 90th birthday. One night, Kenji gets a mysterious text with a random equation that Kenji feels inclined to solve for some reason, and he basically allows a virus called Love Machine to enter Oz and wreak havoc on the real world. Except, I guess he wasn't the one who let him in? Okay, look. This movie has a lot of dumb shit. It's not that it's overly complicated, it's actually pretty simplified most of the time, but sometimes it's a little too simple. Like, when Love Machine is defeated and doesn't end up destroying the world, it decides to just nuke the family home instead. But Kenji is able to maneuver it enough to where it barely misses the home, and I really mean barely. And no one gets hurt from this? And I get Kazuma learns how to fight from his grandpa, but how do physical martial art techniques translate to a 40 hit combo attack on a keyboard? And speaking of characters, that's probably the weakest aspect of the film. Kenji's whole thing is that he's a nerd that doesn't like talking to people, and by the end it doesn't really change. And while he is the main character, the poster implies that he's supposed to share the limelight with Natsuki, who isn't? really in the movie that much. She hires Kenji for the fiancé thing and just kinda hangs around. The only time she gets to shine is when she turns into Ari from League of Legends to be Love Machine at this card game. There's way more things to be upset about in this movie, but I don't think Summer Wars is that bad. It's a huge step up from a girl who led through time in terms of animation, because everything is just so much more refined compared to three years prior. And in addition, the cinematography is just so much more impressive with this film. And I know I said that the characters in this movie were weak, and for the most part, that's still true, but the grandmother was probably the best character in the film. She seems like the intimidating relative that everyone's afraid of, but she's actually really sweet and does a lot to motivate her family through the crisis, pretty much holding the entire family together, even after she dies. Sure, there are a lot of dumb plot contrivances and some pretty piss poor individual character work, but that's kind of hard not to come by in most anime stuff, and that's really not what this movie is about anyway. It's not that important that any one character isn't very developed in this movie. What is important is that every character is a piece of a whole. It doesn't matter if you're related through blood or not, it's about building connections with the ones you care about and building a family around that. Kenji pretends to be Natsuki's fiancé at the beginning, but by the end he's pretty much one of the sole members of the family through their shared experiences alone. Even Wabisuke is just as much of a member as Kazuma or Natsuki. Even when everyone thinks he hates the family, he still cares enough to visit his grandmother, the one who took him in when he was orphaned. I said earlier that Hosoda puts emphasis on character in his movies, but I think with Summer Wars, it's a little different. In a sense, the whole family is its own character, and every family member builds up this personality. This character can be goofy, stoic, strict, and sometimes an insufferable asshat, but it's still its own character. 
So yeah, Summer Wars is really good. It might have some glaring plot and character issues, but it's still a heartfelt and entertaining film about family. Um, I don't really know how to transition here. Let's see. There's kids. There's a, there's some children running around in the movie. Um, there's a dog as well, which is a descendant of wolves. You know what? That works. Wolf Children is a film about a mother named Hana raising her two werewolf children, Ame and Yuki. And... That's what the whole movie's about. On paper, that might not seem as exciting as time travel or a virtual world, but the story is so layered and deep that it doesn't need to have this grand scale story concept to hold my attention. This is without question Hosoda's best film to date. Even with Mirai being the only film of his to be nominated by the Academy, Wolf Children has so much more depth and nuance than any other film he's made before or since. There are two main things I want to cover with this film, the relatability of the characters and the use of wordless storytelling. To start off, the character work in this film is absolutely phenomenal. I loved how Hana gets the main character set up in the beginning of the film and then her kids begin to develop more of a character as they get older. It's segmented in a very calculated and intentional way but doesn't feel any less natural because of it. It feels less like a story and more just seeing life happen to these people. I also really liked how relatable the film was able to be. Like, yeah, there's the theme of growing up and seeing everything through the eyes of a mother, but if the film was more like most Hollywood films, the whole emotional journey would have probably revolved around the kids using their special ability to save the world or something stupid. With this film, the kids being wolves is less of a superpower and more just a part of their life that's just so different from the rest of the community. Similar to how kids from immigrant parents feel living in America. Now, that connection probably wasn't intentional, but it's just just a nice extra layer to the film that I can relate to and appreciate. And the second thing I wanted to talk about was Hasoda's way of telling the story without dialogue. I have been so inspired by how this man is able to convey so much with so little. And like I said before, these movies are best when they're simple, and this film is the perfect example of this. No flashy plot to bait the audience into watching, no unnecessary exposition explaining every plot detail, just beautiful scenery and masterful camera work helping elevate a simple but incredibly profound story. And yeah, that's pretty much the end of the segment. Wolf Children is an effortlessly beautiful and emotional story that is 100% worth your time. There's so much more to this film that I really wish I could get into, but I have three more films to get through, so I suggest these two video essays, or just like, you know, see the movie. It, it's, it's a good movie. Since we're at the halfway mark, I'd figure we'd take a little moment to do a recap. So far, all of these movies have been really solid. Ignoring a few minor issues, Hisoda's stories have all been pretty airtight, and a large portion of that credit goes to Satoko Okudera, who wrote the screenplays for all of these films. However, after Wolf Children, Okudera has seemingly not been a part of Hisoda's project since, so the next three films are written primarily by Hisoda by himself. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but Having someone else involved in the writing process is important to filter out any extra ideas that might take away from the overall narrative, and you'll see that this happens a lot for these next films. For better or for worse. Anyway, here's a meme, I guess. <laughs> The Boy and the Beast is the story of a boy named Ren who, after losing his mother, runs away from home. In the secret Beast Kingdom, Kumutetsu looks for an apprentice to take his place when he becomes the new lord of that kingdom and takes up Ren as his pupil, who he names Kyuta. The story is mostly about the two growing an unlikely but incredibly strong bond with each other to the point where Kumutetsu can't even win his final duel without Kyuta cheering him on. Then it becomes a story about people harboring darkness inside them? I guess? A lot of people will agree that of all of Soda's films, this is technically the quote-unquote worst one, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's still a pretty decent film. But compared to the rest of Soda's catalog, it really just falls flat by comparison. But I'll be nice. Let's start with the good stuff. 
At the beginning of the film, Kyuta is determined to become so powerful that he'd never have to rely on anyone for help. And he learns how to be physically powerful by learning from Komutetsu. But that notion of physical power equating to strength is challenged when he goes back to the real world, where he becomes interested in learning new things and reconnecting with his father. Whether it's power, knowledge, or the strength of the relationship he has with others, the film is just about Kyuta figuring out what strength really means to him. Once again, Hisoda is really good at delving into a character's psyche and translating that into his films, and The Boy and the Beast is no different. I also thought the dynamic between Kumitetsu and Kyuta was really entertaining. On their own, they're pretty decent characters, but the way they bounce off of each other is just so much fun. We're meant to believe it's like the traditional student-master relationship, and then later it's heavily implied that Kumitetsu has been some kind of surrogate father for Kyuta, but I personally like to see them more as brothers more than anything. But that's also something I like. The fact that this relationship is so multi-dimensional that you can't even place one label on it, you just, you just love to see it. And of course, the fight scenes are great, cinematography and camera work is stunning as always, and overall it's just a fun movie. But of course, it wouldn't be very interesting if I only talked about the good stuff. And boy does this film have bad stuff. Something I really love about Hasoda's films is that there's never a real need for a villain to be the source of conflict, mainly because the conflict resides in the character's emotional and personal struggles, rather than something exterior. And I guess this film took that literally, because the whole conflict of the last act is that humans have this dark side inside themselves. And it is hinted at, but the focus shifts entirely towards Kyuta and Kumitetsu that when that plot point comes back, it just feels like it came out of nowhere. Point is, I don't think the story needed an actual villain. As much as I find Ichiroiko's character and story interesting, it just kind of takes away from the overall story of Kyuta. So this is exactly what I was talking about before with these films having ideas that take away from the narrative. There are so many concepts that Hasoda wanted to use in this story, but just didn't have time to fully flesh out. Because of this, I kind of wish this came out as like a show or a longer movie. I wanted to explore Jiro Maru more. I wanted to explore Ichiroiko's character. Hell, even get some more time with Kaede or Iyozen. Because I think they seemed like interesting characters, but there just wasn't enough time to explore all of them. And lastly, I think having the film divulge into this big sword fight just kind of muddles the message. The whole story is about Kyuta being able to be quote unquote strong aside from being physical, but he defeats the bad guy in the end with a sword? Like it looks great and all, but it was an established rule in the beginning that swords should never be unsheathed and we see what doing so would lead to. But I guess all that is thrown out for a cool final battle. You know, you know what, whatever. Also, Ichiroiko is the adopted son of Iozen, who is a hog beast and has an actual son and wife who looks very much like hog beasts. And Ichiroiko <laughs> doesn't look like a hog beast. Like Mans is wearing a makeshift hog skin as a hat and no one noticed something was a little off, like ever. Like why is everyone so shocked by this? You're telling me there were two people in the whole kingdom that could tell this kid wasn't a beast? You're telling me Kyuta, a human, couldn't tell that this was a human. Like, I, <laughs> I, come on. And yeah, that's Boy and the Beast. It's got a whole lot of issues with the story and finding time to explore the right concepts and themes. But even with all that, God damn it, I still like this movie a lot. I can't help it, it's just so much fun. I mean, sure, it's a messy movie overall, but the first two acts carries the film on its back. So ultimately, flaws and all, I'd say it's worth a shot. Okay, 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 transitions, transitions. Um, all right, you take Kumitetsu's name and take off these letters, and then split the M in half, and you have Kun from the next movie. Fucking nailed that shit. Mirai follows Kun, a four-year-old firstborn who's been showered with all the love of his parents until his newborn sister Mirai enters the frame and seemingly steals all the attention. But through a magical tree index in their yard, Kun is able to travel across time and space and learns to have empathy from his family tree in different points in time. So right out of the gate, it's kind of insane that this film exists. The idea of giving a four-year-old toddler a character arc and making it convincing is honestly such a crazy concept, but it's one that Hisoda pulls off surprisingly well. And I mentioned this briefly already, but he pulled it off so well that the film actually got nominated for Best Animated Feature at the Oscars. But it was nominated the same year as Spider-Verse, which, I mean... Come on, it's fucking Spider-Verse. But if that movie was delayed like a year or something, I think Mirai would have had a really decent shot. But being an Oscar nominee is not really an excuse. The film still has a lot of issues. In typical sort of fashion, the plot 
doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The idea is that the tree in Kuhn's yard is like an index that lets Kuhn travel to different points in the family's history, but the way this is initially framed is kind of confusing. At first, we're meant to believe Kuhn is just using his imagination to cope with these feelings, but things happen that just are not possible to imagine as a four-year-old, so I guess it is time travel? But then the whole train sequence happens, and it seems like a dream, so maybe it's supposed to be ambiguous? I don't know. But let's run with the idea that it is time travel for a second. When future Mirai is in the same room as baby Mirai, the present one disappears, but then Kun meets with future Kun at the station and they're both just talking to each other? I, I, why is that possible? And in addition to that, actually, that's the only problem I have with the film. Everything else seems pretty solid. I don't know, there's just a lot to like with this film. What can I say? They didn't nominate the film for nothing because the Academy is very meticulous with the animated films they choose, obviously. Anyway, back to the movie. I really do love how they express the theme of empathy. I know I was making fun of the whole four-year-old character arc thing, but seeing someone so young experience these complex emotions is actually a really good way of expressing these ideas. And the way they go about doing this is just so creative. Like, you get to see Kuhn getting yelled at by his mom for not cleaning up his toys, and then he goes back in time to see that his mom is exactly the same, and it's kind of fucking genius. And speaking of the mom, I really liked how they explored the parental side of the story. Obviously, the mother gets the most treatment, and we even get to expand on her thoughts as an adult, but that also goes for the father, who, despite having only 15 seconds of a flashback, still has some discussion on how he was before Mirai was born, and gets a lot of growth and introspection from these experiences. And I always praise Asoda for his camera work and shit, but this guy is just so good at it. Like, look at this, man. And as a side note, I've been showing clips from all of these movies with the original Japanese dub just because I think English dub sounds super unnatural most of the time. You can do it! Yeah! I knew you were gonna say that! We'll study together, okay? But I actually prefer the English dub for Mirai over the original sub. It sounds like a really weird opinion to have, and I would never say that for any other anime. But at least the English sub has an actual kid voicing the four-year-old. <laughs> Is that the baby? Let me see. I want to see it. But anyway, that's all I have for Mirai. In classic Asoto fashion, it's got a pretty nonsensical plot, but those issues are trumped by the incredible thematic storytelling and character work. It's worthy of the Oscar nom, and it's definitely worth putting on your watch list. You know what, I'm not even going to try doing a funny transition here, I'm just going to be honest for a minute. This is the segment I have been waiting to do for almost half a year, and I am so excited to finally talk about my favorite film that Hasoda has made so far. Belle is a modern retelling of the Beauty and the Beast fairy tale following Suzu, a girl who's lost her ability to sing after a traumatic event from her childhood. She discovers the world of You, a virtual reality where she regains the confidence to sing under the alias of worldwide super idol named Belle. One day a mysterious beast interrupts a concert of hers, but Belle feels inclined to seek out that beast and find out who he is. I know I said Wolf Children was Hisoda's best film, and I still stand by that, but Belle is just my personal favorite film. It's such a stunning movie in every sense of the word. To start off with the music, oh my god, the music is just so good. The OST is really great, but the songs. Kahu Nakamura's voice is so angelic, you just, I never get tired of hearing her voice. It's, oh my god. And the visuals are on another level too. I compliment Hasoda on his visual style like every few minutes, but he really went all out with this film. The way he differentiates you and the real world by not just using different animation styles, but the different camera works as well. I've been throwing the word camera work around pretty loosely, but I really mean it this time. When we follow Suzu around in our day-to-day -day life, all the shots are completely static and kind of boring, which is contrasted by the moving and panning shots in the grand world of you. The only time this changes is when Suzu is singing, kind of bringing her bell persona into the real world. It's just... Fuck, man, that's some gourmet shit. I also really liked how funny this movie was. Like, Hasoda's 
humor is pretty consistent and kind of low-key in other films, but my god. <laughs> Everyone talks about the train scene, which is hilarious, but there's a whole bit where gossip over a guy and a girl is reimagined into some strategy game. Like, it, it has nothing to do with the plot, but like, come on, that's fucking hilarious. And the story isn't lacking either. The trauma that Suzu experienced is what draws her to the beast, later revealed to be a boy named K. She can see there's some kind of deep pain in the beast, one that she can relate to in a way. This all leads to the Beauty and the Beast inspired part of the film, which honestly kind of detracts from Suzu's story, but hey, it gave us another song, so I, I'm okay with that. And finally, the film culminates into a huge climax where Suzu needs to gain K's trust by singing not behind the veil of Belle, but as herself. And my god, when I tell you I was sobbing, Literally getting the footage for this video, I just, I just burst into tears, man. I don't know what to say, this scene is just the best. As much as I'd like to, I won't spoil this for anyone who hasn't seen the film because it is just a brilliant sequence that you should not be seeing for the first time from some shitty YouTube video. Better yet, I think seeing it in the theater is honestly the best way to watch the film. Like, I don't want to be the guy that's like, No, you can't watch Dune on your phone. You need the biggest screen for the best experience. The phone is too small. But I think Bell just really works with that format. Everything about this film just feels so cinematic. Like, everything to the world of you, to the sound design, and of course the songs. And seeing it all on a large screen with big speakers just really helps with that immersive feeling. I don't know, something about big animated movies being in this aspect ratio just makes it more appealing to me. And yeah, that was that was Belle. It's not Soda's best film, but it's got the music, the visuals, the camera work, the voices, and the story to come really, really close. This video will not do this film justice. Please, please watch this movie. So, 20 minutes later, we've gone through all of Mamoru Hosoda's f Wait, what? 20 minutes? Jesus, okay, I thought I was doing that for way longer. It was really fun going through Hosoda's films. Aside from them all being good movies, it was really interesting seeing the similar narrative beats and small details that were consistent throughout every film. In a broader sense, there's this constant incorporation of whales, peaches, and beasts, kind of, I guess. And you can see he likes to use a lot of the same shots in his movies, too. I also like how he reincorporates elements from past films. Whether it's as small as a voice cameo or even expanding on a similar story he already told, it helps sell the idea that these stories are all connected, even without the help of a shared universe. And as a side note, I appreciate that Hisoda really treats his subject material respectively. And to illustrate this point, I'm, I'm gonna talk about Belle again, but hear me out. Something I really liked about Belle is that Hosoda managed to handle this new virtual world as objectively as he could. Think about the metaverse, or even social media right now. On its own, the idea of a metaverse or being caught up in Twitter threads all the time just kind of brushed off for the most part. Like, oh, people who obsess over these things needs to touch grass or like get some- But with Belle, Hosoda utilizes you in a way that doesn't seem like he was forcing any kind of agenda, either for or against it. Sure, there's doubt downsides to it, of course there's downsides, but it also allows for good things and even can save a life. Okay, that last one's kind of a stretch, but you get the idea. I just want to clarify, I'm not advocating for the metaverse or anything, I'm just saying I really liked how Asoda presented the concept in a way where this virtual platform is less of a good or bad thing, but more of a medium where good and bad things can happen. But of course, the main thing that connects all of Asoda's films is his focus on characters and their connections to the people around them. I mentioned this earlier, but all of his stories all center around how important our connections are to survival. Whether it's your lover, your parents, your siblings, your whole family, hell even some stranger that you found on Omegle, Hosoda always goes out of his way to ingrain the importance of connections and love in his films. Now you could make the argument that constantly retreading the same theme every three years sounds kind of lazy, but it's really not like that at all. Love is a really complex feeling, one that you can't fully explore with just one film. Even when he parted ways with Okudera and his screenwriting became a little iffy, that theme of connectivity remained consistent. It's also interesting to hear that Hosoda takes inspiration for these films from his own personal life. Summer Wars was inspired when Hosoda met his in-laws for the first time, and he thought of Mirai when he saw how poorly his own son reacted to a new sister. The fact that most of these stories are just based off Hosoda's own experiences really grounds these films. I kind of like the idea that Hosoda could have just been sitting at his desk and was like, you know, this thing just happened in my life today, I'm gonna make a movie about it. But obviously, he said it in Japanese, or sorry, he th thought it in, yeah, whatever. Anyway, that is every film made by Mamoru Hosoda. 
I'm gonna be honest, this video took a really long time for me to make. I was originally gonna make one about Arcane, but I got lazy and also realized I had nothing interesting to say about it. And then I saw Bell again, and I was like, you know what, this Hasoda guy seems kind of cool. This is probably the most effort I've put into a video so far, which isn't really saying much, but... I really hope you guys enjoyed this. Honestly, I don't really know what to do next. Um, probably just gonna upload more Valorant videos until I figure out what to talk about. But till then, I'll see you guys later.